So this is one of the vernal pools that we have studied quite extensively. There's a lot of mosquitoes. The Hockamock is ground zero for Eastern equine encephalitis, a very rare but fatal disease. This is why the state of Massachusetts does the aerial spraying for mosquitoes. And if the state hadn't been spraying millions of acres that was contaminated with PFAS, I don't know if our contamination would be so bad. So for me, the Hockamock Swamp and these vernal pools are really where it all started, this whole messy story. PFAS are an urgent public health threat. They are toxic, persistent, and being found in the environment across the country. I personally think the magnitude of the PFAS contamination in the United States, particularly, is probably our worst environmental disaster yet. It is impossible to avoid PFAS because it's in our water, it's in our soil, it's in the rain that's coming out of the sky. PFAS at the moment is being found in the blood of every human alive. The last blood bank sample that didn't have PFAS in it came from the Korean War. And nobody is treating this with the care that it needs to be treated because it is such a huge, huge problem. The threat of PFAS is one that emerges over time. It takes a long time to manifest and therefore it makes it really hard to be able to protect oneself and understand the extent of the danger. PFAS stand for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. It's actually an enormous class of chemicals. There are definitely thousands, probably even you know, more than 10,000, and they've been around for decades. They're often called forever chemicals because what they consist of is a carbon atom connected to a fluorine atom, and that's what makes them super, super persistent. PFAS chemicals are used for water resistance, oil and grease resistance, stain resistance. So your Teflon pans, your nonstick pans that you use, those are coated with PFAS. It makes them really good at resisting high temperatures. Think firefighting foam, it reduces friction, think brake fluid. They take a long time to degrade. They stick around in the environment, in our bodies. It's this persistence that makes them really valuable for lots of products. It's also what makes them so dangerous. Ultimately, I came across Kyla Bennett and this discovery that she had made that led to this cascade of fallout regarding PFAS contamination. Don't laugh at my cashews, please. We buy bulk. <laughs> We're making vegan yogurt. I used to buy a vegan yogurt in the store until I realized that the plastic containers might contain PFAS. So I decided to make my own and I make it in a glass container. Even my Vitamix, I got rid of the plastic one and got a metal one. My name is Kyla Bennett and I am the science policy advisor for a nonprofit called Pure which stands for Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility. I worked at EPA for 10 years, but I actually became a whistleblower while I was at EPA. I didn't even really know about PFAS until 2018. I was contacted by an EPA employee who was concerned about PFAS in the town of Ayer, Massachusetts. I started going down the PFAS rabbit hole and decided to test the water of two towns, my own town, Easton, which I thought would be clean because we have no firefighting training facility. We have no industry to speak of. I also tested the town of Sudbury and to my shock, Easton's water was more contaminated than Sudbury's water. It was a mystery as to why. Easton, Massachusetts didn't have any of the typical markers of PFAS contamination, such as firefighting training facilities, military bases, chemical plants. So there was no obvious reason at the time why Easton's water would have had PFAS contamination, but it did. 
Chai, come on out. Chai. In May of 2020, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, very rare type of brain tumor. And I had two surgeries. I was in ICU for a week. It was very difficult. They ran genetic tests on me. They looked at 84 different genetic markers and said that my brain tumor was likely from some kind of environmental toxic. Then she started thinking about the Hockamock Swamp. There was a strange cluster of towns in southeastern Massachusetts where we are that had contaminated water. And I couldn't think of what we all had in common other than the fact that we get sprayed with this pesticide on an almost yearly basis. Could the reason Easton's water is contaminated be related to the fact that state officials in Massachusetts had been using a pesticide sprayed over the Hockamock and vast other areas around the state to curb a deadly mosquito-borne virus? Could those two things be related? The state of Massachusetts engages in aerial spraying of a pesticide called Anvil 1010 to try to kill these mosquitoes. So I decided that we needed to test the anvil. She procured some jugs of anvil 10 plus 10. It's manufactured by a company called Clark Mosquito. And we tested anvil and found PFAS, including one of the most dangerous and most studied PFAS, PFOA, in alarming levels. PFOA, PFOA, is a long chain PFAS that is kind of the poster child for long chains. Long chains have this kind of backbone of carbon atoms of eight or longer, and that is what makes them so incredibly useful. It makes them so incredibly persistent and so incredibly dangerous. They can take years, if not more than a thousand years, to degrade. Researchers have found PFAS chemicals in seemingly every place they've thought to look. They found them in the umbilical cords of newborns in Taiwan. They've found them in the breast milk of moms in Sweden. They've found them in the blood of polar bears. Researchers have linked PFAS exposure to various cancers, infertility, birth defects. The EPA now says that there is absolutely no safe level of consumption of PFOA. That means that any amount that you consume increases your risk of cancer. Late 2020, early 2021, the EPA launches an investigation, tries to figure out the answer. They actually went to the manufacturer, Clark, and they tested the pesticide right out of the machinery, and that didn't have PFAS. So they realized that it was probably leaching from the plastic containers that Clark used to store their pesticide and sell it in. The PFAS were being generated by the process of fluorinating the plastic and then they were leaching into the pesticide as a result. Now this pesticide, Anvil 10 plus 10, was stored in what's called a fluorinated container. It's a special type of plastic that undergoes a process in which it's exposed to fluorine gas in order to strengthen it. And this is a very useful type of plastic that is used not just by pesticide companies, but it turns out throughout the economy. My name is Graham Peasley, and I'm a professor at the University of Notre Dame. My background is in nuclear chemistry, or nuclear science in general. 315 goes to 2.96 keV, and then the 6.4 keV is iron going to be 679. I measured fluorine using a technique that people hadn't used before, and began a long, now 10-year journey into where is PFAS, where does it go, and how do we measure it more quickly and more accurately. I met Kyla Bennett virtually during the COVID pandemic, and Kyla and I, we got hold of a fluorinated container that was sold as such, and we got hold of a non-fluorinated container of the same company, and we designed a study where we would see if we could reproduce the EPA early results of what they saw in a plastic container. And then they also put some ketchup and mayonnaise and olive oil and things in them and tested those as well. If somebody used it for food, could it directly enter the food? And the answer is yes, it could. I wasn't shocked, but I was horrified. I was, I think I cried. 
Ultimately, the EPA determined that just one company in the U.S. is responsible for fluorinated plastic, and specifically a process called post-mold fluorinated plastic, and that company is Enhanced Technologies. Enhanced Technologies is based in Houston, was started in 1983 by two guys. Neither the EPA nor Enhance has disclosed Enhance's customers, but I was able to get my hand on some internal Enhance documents to understand just how pervasive fluorinated plastics were, where in the economy they were used, and what types of companies were using them. They're used by some of the most recognizable consumer brands, Estee Lauder, L'Oreal, BMW. They're used to hold fluids that you have in your home that you see on store shelves every day, weed killers, household cleaners, cosmetics, shampoo, body wash. Fluorinated plastics are pervasive throughout the U.S. economy. So once EPA realized that the PFAS in Anvil was coming from the plastic containers, they came down hard on Clark and they made Clark pull back all of their existing stock and change their packaging. Clark almost immediately launched a recall, costing them millions of dollars. Ultimately, the EPA issues what's called a notice of violation to enhance. This was in March of 2022. The production of these long chain PFAS through fluorination is illegal. You shouldn't be doing it and you must stop. Incredibly, Enhance says, no, we're not gonna stop. They do say we're gonna to try to change the process to limit the amount of PFAS we generate, but ultimately we're just not gonna stop. Enhance submitted thousands of pages of documents saying, yeah, okay, we're creating these PFAS, but it's really no big deal. Ultimately, the Department of Justice gets involved later that year with a lawsuit against Enhance saying you're violating US chemical law and asks the court to find it in violation. Now, Enhance, in response, their legal argument essentially boils down to two points. One, the EPA doesn't have the authority to regulate existing uses of these types of chemicals. And the second argument that Enhance is making is that the amount of PFAS it's generating through fluorination is so small that it's effectively not a problem. When Clark Mosquito had to recall its Anvil 10 plus 10 housed in fluorinated containers, they had to figure out where to go next. The ultimate answer was a company called BP Polymers. So remember the, the main like three peaks? Right. This one peak right here. So the blue sample is the one with Cortrax. Cortrax, it's, the technical term is called polyamide which is the fancy way of saying nylon. Cortrax is different than fluorination in that Cortrax, being a nylon, is actually part of the container itself. It's added to the plastic and then during the extrusion process, binds with the plastic and becomes part of the container. Because Cortrax is included into the manufacturing of the bottle, it doesn't require this post-fluorination treatment. It's not exposed to fluorine gas. I am optimistic that over time, those manufacturers who are currently using fluorinated HDPE are using the fluorination process. I think they will continue to transition away from that. Enhance continues to fluorinate plastics to this day, despite the EPA's demand that it stop, despite uh, the lawsuit from the Justice Department. Kyla Bennett and other people will tell you that this incident and what the EPA has and hasn't done raises really tough questions about whether the EPA is able and willing to hold polluters accountable, to really crack down when necessary. I believe there are two reasons that EPA is not on top of this. One is it's really a huge can of worms. And I think that they don't even know how to begin to approach this. I think they don't want to start a panic. I think they don't know how or who to go after. I'm not optimistic. I, I can't sleep. For years, I use one of the shampoos that enhance 
fluorinates the containers of. And the skin on your scalp is the thinnest skin in your body. And I can't help but think, is that what gave me my brain tumor? I have very little hope on this, very little hope. But I can't stop fighting. I just, it's not in my nature to stop fighting.